Hello and welcome back to Westeros.org's uh, video channel discussing House of a Dragon, the fifth episode. I think this one um, is interesting for a couple of reasons, well, a few reasons, but one reason is it's written by T. Mickle, who is uh, has been in the writer's room, I think, from the start, has been the story editor for a season. This is her first ever, I think this is her first ever man uh, script that she's ever done, but she is. Uh, she started as George's assistant uh, prior to that. Minion, um, <laughs> and she is. She has been kind of um, had a big role in kind of keeping track of lore stuff as well. So I think uh, Ryan has mentioned her before as someone who kind of obviously knows the books and, and knows the material and has been helping them kind of keep things straight. Um, met her a couple times. Uh, she's great, and I think it's uh, it's really great to see this episode because this episode felt very Game of Thrones to me, like in 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 a. A Game of Thrones way, uh, with, with a lot of um, the pol the politics and yeah. the the shifts in power is like a, a big mm. aspect of this episode. So, uh... so we'll start with our episode summary. And uh, in the wake of everything that happened in the last episode, this one opens on Driftmark, where we see Corlys slowly walking up to the Driftwood throne, and he's visibly grieving for Rhaenys. And at the same time, on Dragonstone, we see Rhaenyra looking out over the sunset, also mourning her loss. Uh, so very heavy opening yeah. there. Yeah. Then in King's Landing, mm -hmm. the horns are blaring. Melissa's head is being paraded through the streets. The traitor dragon is dead, mm -hmm. led by Chris and Cole. And the crowd is very silent. It's yeah. qu quite clear if it's uneasy. We even hear someone's call if it's a black omen. Mm -hmm. uh, Gwen. It doesn't seem so infused by the victory either. Mm. Comments on the strangeness of it. Up yeah. on the uh, the battlements, Alice and Eamon are watching, observing the procession, particularly, particularly paying attention to a covered cart. Kind of looks like it has some boxes and crates or whatever yeah. being brought in. And yeah, when we fact, cut inside yeah. the Red Keep and Helena watches as this cart is being brought in and it's, it's Aegon who's carried in there you know, hidden from sight, unannounced. And then when we go to the king's chambers, we're seeing the maesters working on him. And Alison asks if he's alive, and he is for now, but burnt flesh is sticking to the armor that they're peeling off. His leg is severely broken, and he's comatose. You know, he's clinging to life, says the grand maester, but he can't guarantee that he'll, he'll survive. Uh, Eamon walks in. And basically states that someone has to rule in in Aegon's stead, and um, I think he has ideas about who that should be. Then we see Alice leave there, um, and she goes to see Chris, Sir Chris and Cole, and mm -hmm. he's methodically cleaning his sword, and she questions him, "What happened? What happened to the king? What role did Aemon play in it?" Mm -hmm. That one in particular, Cole kind of stops for a long moment, and then resumes, you know, polishing the sword and says, "You know, he couldn't say." It's quite clear that he doesn't want to say what happened. No, and um, so they they have they have some problems there, and obviously on Dragonstone they have even bigger problems. There, the council there is in turmoil over losing their largest dragon. They're la still lacking a ground army. Um, Sir Alfred Broom is blaming it on a marital spat, and basically Rhaenyra ends up challenging him to you know, are you doubting my leadership? And and he says that well, you know, you're a woman. You, you know, women don't generally have knowledge of strategies of battle. Uh, to which she retorts that they've lived in decades of peace and he's seen no more battles than she has, which is a fair point. Uh, but training wise, uh, a frustrated Jace initially plans to visit Harrenhal to deal with Damon. Uh, but uh, while he's speaking to Bella, he realizes that he'd probably have little success with that and, and instead decides that he'll treat with a phrase to secure a clear path for Cregan's forces into the Riverlands. And he asks Bela not to tell Rhaenyra until he's left. Then Daemon, we see him on Caraxes with the Blackwoods, and he is threatening Lord Bracken to his face, telling him to bend the knee or else. And Bracken refuses. A great shot, actually, as we see him riding away, and Caraxes lowering his head, and you're thinking, oh, he's going to burn them, but it's more... The fret Damn, doesn't. I didn't get to burn him. Yes, today. and afterwards, you know, Willem said he you know, should have given them what they wanted, death, and he said, "Well, he he needs men to fight," and mm -hmm. and then he advises Willem to use 
unconventional methods against the Brackens. Yes, they are unyielding in battle, but there's always a way to get them to finally. There's certain money. things that the crown cannot be seen. Yeah, to be doing. That's a big part of it. But the idea is that we can't have people seeing me saying it's okay. But if you decide to have at it, yeah. Uh, um, yeah. Reina, meanwhile, has arrived at the Eyrie and is meeting with Jane Aron. Uh, Jane is not too pleased with the size of the dragons. I have to admit that it would feel a little cheap to say, oh, you want dragons? Here, <laughs> you, you know, for your army, here's two tiny little dragons. Yes. The little kids. She, she points out that she has hunting hounds that are fiercer. fiercer yeah. And uh, yes, they'll grow, but, you know, they're not going to grow that fast. So she, she's not too happy with the bargain. Uh, back on Dragonstone, we have Rhaenyra now seeking out Rosaria. And talking to her about the council's disrespect and her lack of battle training, she admits that, yes, they haven't seen battle, either her or Alfred Bloom, but she hasn't been taught to fight. She hasn't had any of that training. She was taught uh, diplomacy and, and, and politics. Well, she has a mind about, she instead of being handed the sword, she was handed her father's cup, basically, yeah. as his cupbearer. And... Mm. Uh, Miss Arya suggests that she should be using the small folks' unease instead say that the death of Malays has unsettled them and uh, she should get them to, to, you know, get others to do the work for her when she can. So they're sending, uh, they send for uh, the maid, Elinda, and uh, they prepare her to apparently go on a secret mission. Yeah, yeah, that was an interesting angle. Um, we see Rhaenyra and Bela later talking together, mourning Rhaenys, and Rhaenyra gives Bela a box of Corlys containing well, we don't know what it is, but it's obvious that it's offering him the office of hand. Mm -hmm. uh, later, we see Bela try to persuade Corlys. He's drinking, he's, um, you know, he's not at, he's at the old castle, the damp mm -hmm. one. Um, trying to persuade him to continue supporting the cause, but he's angry in his grief. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> then they'll ever have a heart-to-heart -heart about his voyages and her legacy. And she says, you know, but you did it all for, for her, mm -hmm. for Rhaenys. And um, she gives him the, the box with the pin and considers her perspective and then he he also then tells her you know he wants to make her his heir mm. but she says i'm blood and fire and the title should go to sultan sea you know, or sultan stone and walks away um in heron hall uh daemon is uh, again dreaming he's dreaming about sleeping with a targaryen woman Quite actively, turns, yes. Uh, yeah, it turns out to be a vision of his own mother, Alyssa. Um, yeah, and she's calling him her favorite son, and that he should have, you know, he's a strong one, he should have been the one to wear the crown. A uh, bit of an Oedipal complex. There, yeah, perhaps. you can say that. <laughs> you can say that. And then he snaps out of it again and finds himself in the middle of dinner with Sir Simon and his family. They are talking about the grave news from Rook's Rest and the need for more workers to get Harrenhal into shape. Uh, Damon assures Sir Simon that he will guarantee the funds himself rather than depending on Rhaenyra. Then we're back in King's Landing and the council is debating what to do with Aegon's injuries. Allison says, well, I should be regent. The council ends up supporting Aemon instead, including Sir Kristen Cole, who is, just, you know, she clearly... Uh, Allison has a moment as the men mm -hmm. continue talking after that. Kind of, you know, she's the blood in her ears, or the blood, in, and yes, and they're, they're they're at a distance. It's like her, her, her heart beating in her ears. Yeah. You can hear it, and like, oh, I'm, I'm being pushed aside again. And Aemon quickly takes charge, including you know, shut the city gates because people are trying to escape, and and also cut down the bodies of the rat catchers. He's quite uh, insistent about that one. Yeah. Um, cut down the fucking rat catchers. And then we <laughs> see the result of it where. Hugh's wife keeps assisting to her, uh, her husband, you know, to, to flee to live with her brother in Tumbleton. Um, an interesting place to flee to, uh, as, as some may know. Yeah. Uh, fearing the city is no longer safe, and they finally, Hugh finally agrees trying to get away, but the gates are not being closed, just being closed per yeah. Eamon's orders. And then we see that Jace has completed his trip to the twins. He's there. Um, his dragon is sitting outside and he is negotiating with the Freys. Kind of right on the bridge, like in between the two castles, basically. Yeah. Uh, and um, they basically are concerned about the Vagar. That's their main concern. Otherwise, they don't seem particularly eager to support 
Aegon. Uh, but they do want Heron Hall in return if, when Jace promises that he will support them and he'll get Damon to protect them as well. And he says that, well, then you should be bending the knee and not just opening the gates for um, and letting um, Cregan's uh, forces through. No, that, that seems to work. Now we're back at Heron Hall again with Damon chopping wood. <laughs> but he's hearing these like distant screams like from nowhere. And when he goes and delivers the wood up to the scaffolding to be carried up while they're, you know, renovating, Ally shows up and, you know, says comments about how he's not really made for chopping wood. But, you know, he, he says, I'm not going to leave other men to do the things that uh, I want. And so she says, look in his hands and he, you know, he has, he may have a swordsman's, uh, or horseman's calluses, but he doesn't have a wood axe callus. Yeah. So she's, and she tells him about the news she's heard about women screaming, about men finding you know, the women carried away. And when he says, oh, well, who, where, where is this news coming from? And, you know, who told you? And then, you know, no one told me, you know, it's, I, I hear it on the wind. Um, I don't know what he makes of that. No, and then she's blaming him, obviously, for what unleashing he's unleashing this on, uh, on the brackets, on, yeah. on the on the Riverlands. And Damon insists that the realm would suffer even more under Eamon One Eye's rule. And uh, uh, after this, then we um, Sir Simon announces that the Brackens have surrendered. Uh, the Blackwoods are taking Stonehenge, and uh, Damon calls for a feast to celebrate the victory. Uh, we see Dragonstone again, where Rhaenyra is now telling Sir Alfred that she wants to send him away to visit Damon and discern his intentions. And Sir Alfred, of course, will be like, are you removing me from your council? She says, look, I, you've tested me, you have uh, been crying, but she knows she trusts him. Mm. She she knows he's never going to bend the knee to the High Towers. And she asks him to find out if Damon means to raise the River Lords in her name or his own. And when he asks, you know, is there any message... We'll tell him that we'd, I'd like to finish the, our previous conversation. And speaking of Heron Hall, Damon's out of it again, dreaming. And is awakened by Sir Simon, who bring in the now he's actually awakened in the middle of the night and yeah. roused out of his bed, who brings news of the River Lords demanding to see him. And he's uh, not too happy about we, being woken up in the middle of the night, but they accuse him of tyranny because what he has allowed the Brackens to do, or the Blackwoods to do to the Brackens. Uh, and the whole thing about... Um, not that the crown shouldn't be seen doing it because they seem to be carrying the Targaryen banner at least. Yes, so there seems to be some miscommunication. Mis yeah, that there, part was interesting because which it, fits what is done in the book. Yeah, the Blackwoods are yes, oh, they, they do ride out under Rhaenyra's banner yeah. without being asked to. So now, but here they seem to deliberately have either misunderstood or decided like, well, we'll, we'll, we'll do half of what he wants. We want everyone to know what we're doing it for him. It seems a little strange that they would make that mistake, but regardless, it, it definitely. Yeah. Um, we'll discuss this more later in the sort of changes. But material. yeah, now um, they're refusing to support him. We see Alinda arriving in King's Landing. She's got a red hooded cloak and or a robe, and she searches for your gold cloak, and then he leads her to find Daisy. I believe the girl was a serving mm. girl that Egan raped last season. Mm. Uh, we've now seen her now working as a serving girl in this sort of tavern brothel establishment. Uh, so she's gone to see her. And we will have to see what happens after that because that's the end of that plot thread right now. Yeah, we don't see more of that just yet. And then we go to Driftmark and we see Corliss clutching the hand's pin. And he seems to have decided that he's going to take up the office. Uh, it's a brief scene and then there's another brief one in King's Landing. Eamon is standing before the Iron Throne, eyeing it, and Helena appears, appears behind him and asks if the price was worth it. Uh, Rhaenyra is finally on Dragon's Own reading through old texts and discusses Visenya with Jace. Mm. And then praises him for winning over the phrase. Uh, she sort of acknowledges that he kind of did it on his own, but it was the mm. right thing to do. And uh, she's really frustrated with staying behind and sending others to fight. Yeah. And, but she says, we need dragons. We need to have more. And he points out, well, you know. We have dragons. We have dragons, yeah. yeah. But we need writers. And, mm. you know, well, you know, there are, must be many people descendant of Targaryens. People mm. who married out of the family mm. and were descendants. They could all be potential dragon writers. Mm. They just need to search for genealogies and histories to find them. And I think it ends of when you were saying it's mad but it's they're clearly going to try it even though she seems very dubious about putting a malister on a dragon yeah that's funny i don't know why the malisters get that the malister? <laughs> um but uh so that that's where that episode ends with as far as the uh the so we story. know where that's going so changes uh we've already discussed this in the previous book uh, the previous episode about how they changed and reconfigured a lot of the riverland situation 
Um, they're having a decision where Damon lands after the Black was on the road and have gone and Brackets have gone fighting, and he's still reaching out to people and trying to get them to win them over, and this whole thing is happening. And that's this is a they've kind of reconfigured this. Um, in the book, he lands, and that emboldens the Blackwoods to attack, and that also brings a bunch of houses like the Roots and the Dories and the Freys to join them. Yeah. And then when the Blackwoods win the Burning Mill, the remnants of the Brackens retreat to Stonehenge, only to find that Damon has led his loyalist riverlords mm -hmm. to take Stonehenge. Um, so, so that, so now we hear now finally they've taken it, and you know Damon's not personally involved. Plus, in he's gotten all the, uh, you know bunch of the Riverland you know, houses and peasants and what have you, uh, River Lords, I guess they're all supposed to be, who, who come and see him, they're all upset with how he's been doing yeah. it. There's none uh, of that in... in the... And there's none of that. I, so I, I... they are complicating to give him so that he will have a role, so that they uh, you know, can mess around yeah. with Heron Hall and his... Yeah, specifically, I mean, I think Blackwood's going after Bracken land sets. I mean, I'm sure that some would be a little, you know, but they're they're not their own god followers, and it's the Bracken Blackwood feud. It's like, of course, don't don't do that. I mean, mm -hmm. um, but you know, in as far as Fire Blood is concerned, uh, all this stuff has no impact. Like, no River Lords rise up because mm -hmm. of the sets being, you know, of, of, of the Blackwoods being unleashed on the Brackens. No, and and, and as I said. The, when the Blackwoods ride out against the Brackens, they are carrying Rhaenyra's banner, so yeah. they are definitely doing it in her name. And right, another change the phrase. Yes, I think we touched on this as well because the phrase are, as you said, they are already with Damon. Damon, yeah. uh, Forest Frey, uh, uh, Fool Frey, who was a you know a, an early uh, suitor and a supporter of Rhaenyra, uh, was right away on her side. Uh, this does not look like uh, Forest Frey. He's too old for that. Oh yeah, he, yeah, yeah, um, for sure. So they reconfigured the phrase, and obviously they wanted. I'm guessing they wanted a little bit of an echo of Game of Thrones as well. They, yes, that, I think that's the, the main thing. The passage yeah, of yeah. the twins being an issue that they had to treat with them and win over, and obviously they. I think they expected people to go, oh God, somebody's going to treat with the phrase now. Uh, and yeah. uh, He's having dinner with the phrase. This is not going to go well at all. Next thing we're going to see, his head's chopped off and sewed onto his dragon or something. But Oof. uh did not happen. Uh, another detail here, this was a change or is a, it's unwritten history, I suppose. Uh, Damon has his big thing all right, from the previous episode and now this one as well, you know. Call me your grace. Yeah, and now... Or, or you know, your king. Yeah. Um, and uh, Sir Simon is very uh, brave to be insisting that it should be king... Consort. Co and then he adds consort. What do you call the, the queen's uh, husband? And then king. Probably, yeah. Consort. Uh, Never mentioned Fire and Blood. No. There's nothing about him... They're playing caring. up his ambitions, obviously. They're doing it with <coughs> him, you know, beheading young Rhaenyra uh, when he meets her. In in the throne room, they're doing it with having his mother um, uh, telling him that she he should have been wearing the crown. So they're definitely playing up his ambition. Then we have Corvus's voyages and the reason behind it being given as well. He did it all for Rhaenys. Uh Is the idea here is that he wanted to raise a huge fortune as a means of convincing Jaehaerys to allow him to marry Rhaenys? We're a bit. Dubious, but this is at all George's intention. Uh, and it's worth recalling that there's a big age difference between the sea snake and Rainus in the book. He's in his mid 30s and she's 16 when they marry, while his his voyages go over a long period of time. Um, the first voyages, he couldn't possibly have had any intentions for her then. She was an infant. You or sure? perhaps even born. <laughs> Well, I mean, so he I, could have in had intentions for a, a Targaryen daughter, and I suppose, but no, I, I, I really don't think that is the case. Also, I mean, here's, I mean, is this popping in my head? There's, there's something else that completely negates this, I think, which is that when he was young, they sent Diella Targaryen, Jaehaerys' own daughter. That's true. Not his granddaughter, to put 
for him to be particularly marrying her. So he did, this wasn't necessary even before he did any these no, that's, voyages. That's true. That's true. So he this could is have had this, the dialogue, but she said no. Yes. I, I mean, I let, now, unless I want to say something, well, it's not that he. It's that he felt he needed to give her all of this to be to be worthy yeah. of her. I suppose. I. I. It's a nice line. It, it just kind of gives you a, a very strange sense of what he was doing or why he was doing it. I mean, he was an adventurer. He was an adventurer at heart. He, he wanted to see what was beyond the horizon, and what was beyond the next, you know, what I what mean, were unknown seas. It's the Sinbad of, uh, of Westeros crossed yeah. through the sure. two other explorers. Yeah, so, so, so this is this part is... It's, it's, it's not... romantic and cute. Maybe that's what they told Bela. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I, I mean, it's, it's, it's his ambition and then his... yeah. yeah. So, uh, background details. Uh, we have uh, the dragon seeds about to play a big part. Yeah. With a setup at the end here, and now we discussed this when um, when Ulf was in the previous episode. He's the first, I think, to mention dragon seeds. He's seed. the first yeah. to mention it, and and there it is sort of used in the context that we would have expected: Targaryen bastards, uh, primarily bastards who were on you know. Dragonstone and and around there because of the as as you said the 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 first night rights that they were claiming prior to yeah. uh, Jaehaerys and Alessane, uh, and that people were quite happy to grant because it was uh, a nice thing to have a a dragon lord bastard in your family, but here they're talking <coughs> about them as. Targaryens who married out of the family. Well, they're not calling them dragon seeds, but they're talking about the possible possible dragon riders as people who married out of the family. And their descendants, yeah. And their descendants. So basically, they're not bearing the Targaryen name any longer because it was daughters marrying into other families. It's very strange that they're mentioning this idea that, you know, yes, the Targaryens are going around taking advantage of their power and to sleep with whoever they wanted and then you know oh you know how wonderful it is that you you have this beautiful baby and yeah obviously i i don't know if they're trying to whitewash the Targaryens a little bit um yeah. by by not mentioning this fact that they that the Targaryens we follow the practice of the first night i mean this is this was been a i was gonna say this, the, the, this formalized practice was been strange to the Valyrians. I doubt they had the exact mm -hmm. same thing, but I presume the Valyrian dragon lords made extremely free of their slaves and their servants and whoever else was under their dominion. On Just the other like, hand, I don't know that they would have necessarily wanted the uh, dragon riding genes spreading among the lower ah, that's a good point. in Valyria. That is a good point. So as they much. probably were not keen on having bastards. bastards. Mm -hmm. On the other hand, the Targaryens <coughs> are the only Valyrians on, or dragon riding Valyrians left. Yeah, left. They are probably less concerned about that. They probably yeah. think that spreading their genes is a good idea. That they themselves may only marry as much as they can within the family to keep the blood pure, but they probably don't mind if there pops up the occasional dragon rider partially because they control all the dragons anyway. So, yeah. yeah. So this is probably something that happened with the Valyrian, or the, when the Targaryens came to yeah. Dragonstone. Yeah, yeah. Um, so interesting, they just don't mention that aspect. Uh, it'll be interesting to see if it comes out in the next episode. Uh, and, and to finish things up, there's dragon facts and lore. Uh, we have one piece of information here, where we are told in that conversation between Jason and uh, Rain and Yura, that Visenya was Vogar's first writer. No, no, I don't not think I don't think that's possible. Mm. Vogar is old already when Visenya is born. So it seems I mean, the dragon was definitely born on Dragonstone, but they've been on Dragonstone for over a century at this when you know Visenya's around. So I mean when the, the three dragons are <coughs> at the field of fire, uh, Valerian and Vogar and Maraxes are all already very large. Yes. Um, how precisely that works with them, you know. We're not going to get into discussing, because I, I think I've mentioned this before, the complication of the size of the dragon skulls. There is uh, no complication. Well, there, there, there is, is no complication. Little, no, no complication. No, there is no complication. I, I've explained this over and over. I know you have explained it, but I don't quite buy the fact that it was... I don't want to... Valgar lives for many years after Meraxes. Yes. So has it Vogar has a chance to but, grow. But Vogar is counted third, isn't she? 
is Valerian Meraxis Valgar. Yes, but we don't know when Meraxis was born in relation to Valgar, I believe. Yeah. So I just, I just, it just feels like Valgar would have grown to be. I, I also think this than... idea that all dragons have the exact same yeah. rate of growth. We know obviously this whole idea about the dragon pit causes complications to growth yes. for dragons. I think there's uh, plenty of reasons, and and you know even, I mean obviously when you talk about a star as a fire, Danny's dragons are growing very fast compared yeah. to the dragons in Fire and Blood, but this could be the unique magical nature of Rebirth, mm -hmm. the fact that they seem to have been these hardened, some claim that they were hardened, you know, ancient fossilized, fossilized egg. eggs. <laughs> now we probably <laughs> think that's not true, but they're, they're old eggs that yeah. have been waiting for a very long time to be born. That, these things may yes, all be factors no, no. In, in George's uh, mind. And they're not being raised and, in uh, a dragon pit. Uh, but yes, anyway, um, Valgar, by her size, at uh, when Lucenia is riding her, must have been old. Uh, we know that Valgar and Meraxes were not brought from Valyria. That was only Valyrian was the only one who was uh, left yeah. uh, from that time. Uh, but when they were born on Dragonstone is, is uncertain. We don't yeah. know that. So first rider, unlikely. Another thing we know is um, we thought we'd go kind of which dragons have died in battle. So we now have Melis has died in battle. Mm. Before her, it would have been um, Quicksilver. This mm. one is, is the dragon ridden by uh, Prince Aegon. He is the nephew of Maegor the Cruel, who has been usurped by his uncle. Yeah. Uh, he thought he was going to succeed his father, uh, King Aenys, and Maegor said, nope, me first. Uh, and anyways, I mean, very brave of him to go to war. Uh, at the God's Eye, interestingly enough, that's, this is not the first time this will be happening, dragons meeting above the God's Eye. Um, or, well, that is the first time, but it's not the last time. I should say, uh, and it's no, it's no contest. Uh, this uh, Indonesian artist, a fan artist named, well, he's a he's a professional artist, but he does fan art. Rudolf Hima, I believe his name is. He did a really fantastic depiction of Valyrian and Quicksilver, and Quicksilver is so tiny in relation to Valyrian and Black mm. Dread. Um, really? If you think if you think Volgar yeah. and Malice is a um, mismatch, it's it's nothing compared yeah. to to that. Uh, but anyways, Valyrian. Tore Quicksilver's wing off, and the dragon fell to his death. And before that, of course, we have Meraxius dying uh, in Dorne um, at the at the Hellholtz when a lucky scorpion bolt found the dragon's eye. It's pretty much the only way a scorpion bolt will kill a dragon. Is it? Yes, actually, one of the things we could have mentioned for the previous episode was that when Malays is attacking at Wood's Rest, they do try launching scorpion bolts at her. Uh, but from, they only from, make, yes, uh, yeah. Cole's army. Yes, yes. Uh, okay, yes. Cole, but that only makes her angry. Oh, yes, yes, it's mentioned. Yeah, specifically, they tried. So uh, they thought that maybe they'd have a chance to bring the dragon down, <coughs> at least injure her, so that to make it easier I for the dragons. I think that someone pointed out that like, surely part of the hope is just you fill the air with enough bolts and arrows, maybe you'll get the, the rider. Mm. Now, I don't know about a. A riderless dragon is any better than a ridden dragon, <laughs> as far as your forces are concerned at that moment. But um... probably not. Uh, but but yes, uh, they did not have any success with that. So um, uh, it's not that common for dragons to die. No, no. Um, Three Valerian dragons obviously in... managed to die from old, old age. age. Finally, um, what that age might have been at that point. Well, the dragon was born before they came over, so the. Yeah. Uh, Two centuries, maybe? We don't know exactly. Yeah. So uh, until then, until the next episode, uh we'll see you we'll see you guys then.